Good evening, welcome. Thank you all very much for being here. My name is Russell Shorto. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute. Uh, when the Institute began in Amsterdam in 1987, it began by bringing uh, the likes of Norman Mailer and Saul Bellow, uh, real uh, prominent American literature figures, to Amsterdam. And we have uh, broadened out from that over the years into politicians and historians and journalists and uh, filmmakers and others. Um, but I, anyway, like to think that the stock in trade is still uh, the, the top American uh, literature figures. And tonight is a case in point. We're very pleased to have Michael Cunningham, I believe for the third time uh, in the past uh, 15 years or so. Uh, most of you probably know how our evenings work. Uh, we will have uh, a moderated, uh, you'll have first a reading and then a moderated discussion and then opening it up to questions. And after that, um, Michael will sign books and he'll sign books. Uh, he'll stay up here and sign books. Our moderator tonight is Nina Siegel. She is an author and a journalist. She was born in Manhattan, has lived in San Francisco, Iowa City, Brooklyn, and now in Amsterdam, where she is the editor of Time Out Amsterdam. Her writing, her journalistic writing, has appeared in the New York Times, Salon, the Wall Street Journal, and many other publications. Her first novel, A Little Trouble with the Facts, came out in 2008. Uh, we are very pleased to have her uh, as our moderator. Please welcome Nina Siegel. Thank you, Russell. We are adaptable creatures. Thanks, Alice, a character in Michael Cunningham's first novel, A Home at the End of the World. It's the source of our earthly comfort and I suppose of our silent rage. In his newest novel, By Nightfall, um, Cunningham's protagonist, a prosperous 44-year-old New Yorker, Peter Harris, has adapted to his life as a semi-successful gallery owner and resident of an expansive, if thin-walled, Soho loft he shares with his wife, Rebecca, a magazine editor. And yet, there is something of that silent rage. Something is missing from his career. As an art dealer, he wants to find art that is not just saleable, but also, forgive him for his romanticism, actually moves him and says something enduring and meaningful about life. And something is missing from his life, too, a sense of beauty. He is aging, his wife is aging, everything is a little bit tarnished. All of this is called into high relief by the arrival of Rebecca's younger brother, a fresh male version of Rebecca's younger self, Ethan, who is known by his family as Mitzi, or the mistake. Peter sees something he needs in this mistake. Quote, looking at Mitzi's solemn profile, his aristocratically hooked nose, the shock of hair that trembles on his pale forehead, Peter thinks, this is what he wants from art, isn't it? This soul sickness, the sense of himself in the presence of something gorgeous and evanescent, something, someone that shines through the frailty, frailty of flesh. And so begins the following sequence of events. I'm not going to tell you about it. You'll have to read it for yourself. <laughs> Michael Cunningham is the author of five novels, one nonfiction book about Provincetown, and the editor of a book on Walt Whitman, of Walt Whitman poems. Born in Ohio and raised in California, Cunningham received his undergraduate degree at Stanford University and his master's in fine art from, in fiction from the prestigious Iowa Writers' Workshop. Shortly thereafter, he was published first in The New Yorker and included in Best American Short Stories. His territory is our small private trials that reflect a sense of deep despair, but it's his compassion for that struggle in his characters that rivets us to every word. His tour de force, The Hours, which explored this territory via the lives of Virginia Woolf and two women living in modern day America, won both a Pulitzer Prize and the, Pun and the Penn Faulkner Award, and was turned into the Academy Award-winning movie starring Nicole Kidman, Julianne Moore, and Meryl Streep. Specimen Days, the novel that followed, entered the lives of three different characters in three very different lives, 
all haunted in some way by the words of poet Walt Whitman. And his latest novel, By Nightfall, which brings the narrative closer to home, is subtler. It doesn't utilize the sweeping devices employed in his previous books. It is, in many ways, a more intimate novel about three people who happen to live together, who happen to be part of the same family. All of them have their private demons and their public personas. Each of them yearns for a kind of connection that is elusive, or once attained is intractable and impossible to hold. Michael Cunningham's characters have a nagging suspicion that they may not be living their intended lives, that somewhere back there, somewhere along the way, they turned onto the wrong path and walked into perhaps some kind of theater. And since then, they are playing a role in which they may have been miscast. <laughs> they perform, and they often perform with surprising skill, exhibi exhibiting impeccable social manners, genuine wit, and even perfect comment comic timing. Meantime, inside, they are beset by longing for a version of themselves that might have been. There's another person somewhere uh, back there living the life that they were intended to live. Then they shake off that sensation. They seek, moment by moment, to situate themselves on the stage, to free themselves of these concerns, and to find some excitement, even, in the current performance. Youth, of course, represents possibility. Life has now become a more limited set of circumstances. One can change only through, through some sort of radical action. But if they take that radical action, everything might change, too. In short, Cunningham's fiction explores how we try to outwit, trick, or trade on our own mortality. Yes, we are full of silent rages, frustrated desires, those what-ifs. Yet Cunningham's characters are largely bound to this world by one thing, beauty. They find life's purest meaning in novels, in poetry, in works of art, ancient, modernist, and contemporary. They balance what frail existences they have on a fence that's built on others, other artists' attempts at creating and presenting something of enduring value. They may fail. That's how most of us live our lives, after all, trying and failing. And ultimately, failure is there because death is an inevitability. But in the meantime, beauty is evoked in every word, every sentence. It is explored, it is contemplated, and exalted. And never more so than in this new novel, By Nightfall, an intricate meditation on the nature of beauty and life. Tonight, he will not be reading <laughs> from his new novel, but from a work that he is currently in the, progress of, in the process of writing. And um, I am very pleased to be able to welcome Michael Cunningham to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Michael Cunningham. Oh, thank you, Nina. Thank you, John Adams Institute, for having me back. Um, yeah, it's true. I hope you will bear with me. Uh, I, would, I would actually prefer to read to you from the, brand, the, the novel that's so brand new, I was actually working on it in my hotel room this afternoon. Uh, if, if, if anyone came very particularly to hear me read from By Nightfall, I'll do little private paragraph readings over... over um, Next door, I have a pen just in case I need to cross out a line as I go. Uh, this, is, this is a novel very much in progress. It's called Sleepless. Water, yay. Daddy, get, Daddy gets thirsty in the middle of all this. Uh, There's a, wad of, there's a wad of gum up here. <laughs> Just had to tell you. Um, it's not all glamour. <laughs> there's, there's, there's occasionally gum on the podium. It just happens. <clears throat> We've been awake three or four days now. It isn't the drugs or the music or the dying dog. It isn't only that. It's more because we've gotten too nervous and interested to sleep. We've been so many places. 
We stopped setting our clocks long ago when we realized it was always going to be too late. That doesn't mean we abandoned hope. We just settled into other ambitions. A day's pay for a day's work. A safe place to park for the night. The pure, windy nowhere of a proper high. We had Pilot, our shepherd retriever mix, <clears throat> who took everything that happened with the same baffled good cheer. We had Heather, our sister mother, who'd had the good sense to jump into our truck and leave it all behind. The waitress apron, the Pittsburgh rain. If you're willing to call us pilgrims, you could say we were taking the little path. Wherever you look for us, we've always just left. But when your dog starts sighing into herself, when you know from her eyes that she's ready to disappear, you stop driving and pick her a spot. You get her a little stillness. You make her a bed out of quilts and towels. You use the last of your money to rent her a house. This house is far north, far enough that in summer, night brushes across it all like a silk scarf. It's granite and sky here, witch pines, the blue-black mirror of the ocean, and us, a strange dream this old house is having, Pilot panning softly in her corner, no longer paying attention to the food and water we keep putting out. Trask and I still using, and Heather not. She's got a plan, massage school, Swedish or shiatsu. There are arguments for both. Tonight, our third or fourth sleepless one, Trask and I make out on the sofa, sit with Pilot as she huffingly contemplates her final mystery, watch the ocean turn black, read the bloated old magazines, and play the old music we found here. Our favorite being John Coltrane blowing into his horn, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Trask and I do a slow, snaky dance to the Coltrane, blissed out on the last of the Delauded we copped in Burlington. Heather says, you boys are too much. It's a surprising thing for her to say. I'd assumed we were too little. Heather stands solidly in her lace-up boots, hands on hips. Her platinum hair is the brightest spot in the room. She could be the wife of the music. Everything about her is famous to us. Trask says, yeah, our careers as modern dancers were tragically cut short by circumstances beyond our control. Heather shakes her head over the oddness of us. I could say something like, don't go, but we all know it's time. She's ready for a mailbox and a washing machine. She can't survive anymore on whatever Trask and I don't need for ourselves. Later, Trask stands with me on the front porch, gaunt and blue-white as a medieval saint. Heather's inside, sitting in a murky pool of lamplight, reading one of her holy books. Out here, it's strands and helixes of stars. It's the single hour of true night. And I know what Trask is thinking, because I'm thinking the same thing. The earth is forgetting us. Look at all that it's forgotten already. Look at what it chooses to remember. Wind-gnarled trees and rocks washed by tides. A single star riding a pool of tide water. Trask says, hey. I say, hey, yourself. <clears throat> Trask and I don't need to converse much. We're thinking now about burying Pilot in the pine grove we found above the house. We're thinking of ourselves as two figures in a bus station parking lot getting smaller and smaller as we wave goodbye to Heather's bus. Trask says, you know, it might be nice to stay somewhere for a while, which is not what I was thinking. Should we stay here, I ask. Trask hoots out a laugh. <laughs> yeah, right, he says, and we pay for the castle. How exactly? I laugh along with him. Money is one of the questions I tend to forget about. We have a good long laugh together, each of us cracking the other one up. We seem to be laughing about the joke of the world, its avenues and palaces, its immaculate stores, blazing and trumpeting along as Trask and I cavort on the edges, little clownish guys, all battered hat and broken shoe, shuffle dancing, laughing at each other. 
when we once expected to become kings. Pilate is disappearing, I say. Yeah, Trask answers. Yeah, she's been a good dog. Where should we go if we don't stay here? Yeah, where would you like to go, little friend? Someplace warmer, maybe. Okay, we'll head south. South is good, I say. Yeah, well, south is south, he answers. Trask believes there's no home in the world, not for anybody, but I maintain that it's exactly the opposite. It's all homes. Some of them are rich and comfortable, and some of them are bleak, but even the worst of them, even the parking lot behind the Stuckies where he got robbed by the handsome young hitchhiker on the hottest day of the year, even that gas station men's room in Nashville, they were homes. We stand quietly, watching the wavelets curl and the stars caught in the trees. Trask makes the soft click of sorrow in the back of his throat. He's tired of being tired. To remind him that he's not disappearing, I run my finger down the buttons of his spine. He tussles my head. Inside the house, Heather puts on a new old record. It's Bruce singing Thunder Road. He's driving out tonight to case the promised land. He was somewhere when he sang that song. He's somewhere else now. And we're here, right here. I have Trask's backbone to touch. He has the hair on my head. Then it's us, driving into a future that looks like a preview of the past. Pilot is wrapped in her quilt underground. Heather is on her bus. I sneak a look at Trask's profile as he shifts gears and curses the dying transmission. It still surprises me, the fact of him. Here is his glowy pallor, his modest jut of nose. Trask and I are lovers, but we're not boyfriends. We're too brotherly for romance. We're twins born of different mothers. Kissing Trask, poking around with him, is like kissing my improved self. I felt strange about it at first. Strange, though, always turns out to be the new normal. A radio plays the passing songs. Trask finger drums the steering wheel in time to the music, which is his way of keeping the truck alive. If there's enough music in the truck, if there are maps and Slim Jims and crushed Coke cans, if he taps the wheel and smacks the dashboard every now and then, the truck won't blow its transmission. We're rumbling through the endless forests of Massachusetts, which turns its woods to the highway. In there, on the far side of the trees, the mansions of dead millionaires give back birds and branches from their blind windows. Cracked fountains offer little cups of sky. Here, on the highway, it's wind-stirred trash and the occasional deceased raccoon. Here inside the cab, it's music and tapping and silent prayer. Live on transmission, till we've got, at least until we got more cash. Trask says, let's stop in Fall River. It's the first thing he's said in more than 300 miles. OK, I answer. Now, I could ask him why, but I decide not to. I've learned that all my questions have answers attached, and the answers arrive in their own time, as if they're on a line that stretches only so far before it snaps back. Sometimes it's best to wait for that to happen. We pull into Fall River at that hour of early evening when the lowering sun sets it all ablaze, when the humblest of human works is exalted, when it's most obvious that something, even if it's only sunlight, pays attention to every mobile station and McDonald's, every auto salvage yard. The sky is thumbed and streaked with gold. As we drive across the rust-scabbed bridge, it throws its net of lattice shadow over us, while Fall River shines on its hills like a consecrated city. It's Fall River, I say. Yeah, it is, Trask agrees. We drive down Central Street, past the stores that haven't gone out of business yet. Fall River is dying the way Pilot did, sighing its days away, growling softly into itself. Fall River was born when beaver pelts were treasures, and it hasn't been born again since. People amble along Central, unhurried, because there's no place to go that they haven't already been. 
right away, I think I see my mother, but it's not her. It's a woman who looks like her, wobbling along in two sweaters, wearing whatever grace she's got left to muster, carrying a bag of empty cans. That's not my mother, I say by way of observation. Nope, Trask answers, it's not. We give ourselves a brief tour. It is all precisely itself, minus a few shops and diners. We drive by Dunkin' Donuts, where younger versions of us still hang out, sucking cigarettes and clocking the passing cars. There's a kid who resembles me, same ratty hair and bad skin, pulling on a cigarette and talking away, telling the daily beads. He is speaking into the silence of the others, like I used to do. Grubby as he may be, he shines with an optimism the others don't care to put out. He believes there are things to talk about, places to leave too. I put a silent blessing on him as we drive on. There's more than one of me, I say. <laughs> Buddy, one of you is more than enough, Trask answers. Now, I never thought Trask was responsible for the accident. How can anybody be responsible for an accident? You're motoring along, happy and free. You're blasting your favorite song on the dashboard radio, and Trask passes you the joint as you narrate the new details of your amazing future. And you drop the joint, and suddenly there's a tree in front of you. That happens sometimes. Trask has been with me ever since. That's the saintliness of him. I do my best to resemble myself, but it gets harder over time. I wonder if that's why we've come to Fall River, to remind me of who I used to be. I don't have the language or the ambition to put that thought into a sentence. Instead, I say, Fall River is disappearing, too. No, nah, buddy, Trask answers, we're disappearing. Fall River is right where it's always been. We've been gone a year, or maybe it's more like two. Time doesn't obey the calendar when you live the way we've been living. We drive by my old building, which is still defiantly yellow, still offering to passers-by its womanly porches and its garden of thriving thorn. It is now untenanted by anyone we know. I wonder if we're here to look for my mother, though there's no reason to think she'd come back. A dump, I say, though I don't exactly mean it. On rare occasions, I, sell, I tell Trask something that isn't quite true. The truth is I love that old wreck of a building. Our apartment smelled like perfume and wet dog. My mother made dinner almost every night, even on the bad ones. It wasn't her fault that the world of money and surprises was too much for her. Here and there, we pass people we used to know. Here is deranged Mike, sitting on a playground swing set, wondering over his shoes. There is pretty enough Darlene in cowgirl boots. There are Mr. Floyd, who has no known first name, and the Dutra twins, and Edie, who got in the paper for turning a hundred and still being vicious. We do not stop for any of these people, and they don't seem to see us driving by. We've become less visible from being gone. When dark comes, we go and park behind the school, a big elephant-colored building haunted only by itself. I wonder if we're going to break in and have a ramble through the hallways, but it seems we're going to keep sitting in the truck. We smoke for a while in silence. Then Trask says, "And yeah, what do you think we'll do when we get south? The same as we've always done, right? By which I mean we'll get jobs doing whatever. Maybe we'll meet another girl for Trask. We're just bums, you know. No, you're Trask and I'm Billy. Trask leans over and kisses me harder than usual. I kiss back, but he's crushing his teeth into mine. It's more like a mouth punch than a kiss. There's no returning it. I can only hold on. I put my hand in his hair. When he pulls his mouth away, I say, there's nothing to do about love, huh? Trask just nods and lights another camel. We sit there for a while, watching the school get that much older. The lower windows sport construction paper flowers. We can see the upper half of a globe. Planet Earth, right where it's always been. 
Then we're off to the blue point. It's sparse this early. Harry and Everett and little Harry are on their stools where we left them however long ago. They nod to us as if we saw them only last night. Noreen stands behind the bar, grandly enormous, coral-lipped. She says, well, as I live and breathe. Hey, Tress says. I smile. And just exactly where have you motherfuckers been, she asks. She is like a landmass, Noreen. She's geological. You could moor a ship to her flanks. Eh, here and there, Trask answers. Noreen's gray hair won't stay in its rubber band. Her personal bigness will barely stay in her flesh. She's wearing the flower-covered dress. Behind her, bottles glow amber in the light. And you didn't find any place better than here? She laughs, a big raucous sound that comes hackingly out of her smoky depths. Trask doesn't answer that, and I don't either. Trask sidles up to little Harry, slips him one of our last twenties, gets the tiny envelope in return discreetly under the bar. This hasn't changed either. Before we duck into the men's room, Trask leans over the bar and speaks to Noreen softly, too soft for me to hear. Noreen listens, nods. She wears an uncertain look. Trask motions me into the men's. We do the coke in two big hits under the fluorescence. The walls are full of messages. Lit up from the coke, Trask says, you know, Fall River isn't so bad. You know, we've been to worse places, wouldn't you say? Well, we have, but we've been to better places, too. I say, I miss the house in Newfoundland. You know, it was a shithole, Billy. Trask says, and we couldn't even afford that. The pilot is buried there. We dance to John Coltrane's horn. We fall briefly back into our customary silence, but I decide not to let it hold. I say, Heather was like the music. Yeah, if music could complain and steal your drugs. You loved her. You miss her. <laughs> it was only a matter of time. I mean, right. Driving nowhere with two losers, that's a future a girl would want. I say, it'll be nice to be in the South. Oh, it's pretty nice here. Now, I don't know how to answer that. Trask has always been unenthusiastic about, about Fall River until now. He turns around, unbuttons to piss. As he's pissing, the toilet seat falls and spatters him with his own pee. Fuck, he says. He kicks the toilet bowl. His boot slides squealingly across the porcelain. More piss spatters around. Peeing, Trask pivots and bangs his head against the towel dispenser. His forehead makes a melony sound on the metal. <coughs> I grab him from behind. I hold him, just close. Fuck, he whispers, softly like an endearment. It's all right, I tell him. Now, this is not entirely true, but it's a thing to say, like saying good night when we go to bed. Trask shrugs me away, not ungently. He tucks back into his jeans and walks out. I follow. In the bar, Noreen has set up two shots for us. She says, eh, drinks for the conquering heroes. We down the shots. Trask talks quietly again to Noreen, who nods her vast head. I'm not meant to listen. I tune in <clears throat> on the jukebox, which is playing an old song about a good woman gone wrong. After a while, Trask says to me, you know, I'm going to go see if Kathy's still around. Kathy was his girlfriend. Maybe she's still around. Maybe she isn't mad anymore. I'll come, I ask. Eh, better if I see her alone, he answers. He stands with me for a moment. We can't kiss, not in front of Everett and the Harrys. See you soon, he says. Yes, I answer. There is something I'd like to tell him. Something about love and crazy gratitude. Something about a forgiveness we share. I want to hold him, which we can't do here. I want to bite his ear off 
I want to put a benediction on his suffering, wounded head. My lips are sewn shut, though, and my boots are soldered to the floor. All I can manage is a modest smile. He does his best to smile back, but his mouth won't work that way at present. He looks at me, and then he's gone. Would you like another drink, sweetheart? Noreen asks. Trask has a little bit of money in his pocket, but I don't tell her that. I just say, mm, thanks, I'm not thirsty now. Noreen says, now how about you go in the back and bring in those cases of beer that are out there? I am getting too old to have cases of beer around like I've been doing. I say, okay. I go out the back, past the toilet stalls, past the little room called office, where Noreen figures the orders and the money and whatever else she does. I look in. The room is cozy in its way, comfortably cluttered, with a modest window perfectly centered on the moon of a street light. It smells like Noreen, like petrified tulips. There's a cot there. Narrow, but fine for one smallish person. Then I'm out and back, under the Fall River stars, which shine like they do everywhere. The same for the victorious and the fallen. The same for the people who are neither, who are just marking their time. Here are three cases of beer, neatly stacked by the delivery man. Here's the parking lot with its veins of weed, and the black hulk of the dumpster, and the chain link fence, and the rear end of the Walgreens. And here's that buzz in the air, like plucked wires mixed in with a low huff, huff, huff. This sound is always in my ears. It is, I think, the sound the earth makes as it spins through the black, chucked at by fists of dust and ice. After the accident, a looseness opened in my skull that lets me hear it. It's the only thing I've never told anyone. It's the last thing I hear at night and the first in the morning. The earth turning, blowing through me. I'm like a horn being played. I stand another minute in the brightened dark. There's the beer to bring in and Trask's pee to mop up off the men's room floor. I can wipe down the bottles and refill the peanut bowls. You know, Noreen is stingy with her peanuts. I won't be like that. I'll be generous and kind to people, even the ones who take kindness as an insult. I will be steadfast. I will listen to the sound of the world. I will practice every day at being myself. I will wait here, right here, for Trask, so he knows where to find me when he comes back. I lift a case of beer and carry it inside. Thank you. There we go. Uh, yeah, there yeah, we go. Oh, yeah. you just That's have to better. put the light on. Okay. okay. Is it there? All right. <laughs> uh, so tell me about where that chapter lies in the new book. Is that um, the That's beginning? That's the opening. That's the yeah, opening. yeah. Okay. On, to cha on to chapter two. Um, and how far along are you in that? That's it. <laughs> That's all I've got. <laughs> that is the novel in its entirety. Wow. Well, it's brave to just trot it right out here and read it in front of the audience right away. You know, I, 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 it's more fun for me. I don't know if it's more fun for other people, but um, I, 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 well, I love and sort of hate my novel, as, as, as one does. Um, but it's just sort of more interesting to me to, to read something brand new. It feels, it feels differently alive to me mm -hmm. when, it's, when it's still in progress. Um, yeah, I guess it's risky, but it's, it's, Hey, I, I live for danger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, do you have a title for this new novel yet? Well, it's called Sleepless, or maybe it's called The Snow Queen. Okay. 
<laughs> I'm not quite sure which of those two, or maybe it's called something else entirely. Who knows? And how do you go about starting a book? Well, first of all, you're on tour with this book. You've been on tour for about five weeks already. Yeah, yeah. So you're living in the world of your current novel, and but you're sitting down in the day and you're working on something new. What's that like? Um, it's, it's, it's pure self-preservation. <laughs> I have learned that the most important thing about having a novel out is, is to be engaged in another one so that the novel in question feels a little bit detached from you. It feels like something somebody else wrote. And you can talk about it as if you were talking about somebody else's novel. Um, and you can feel a certain distance from it mm -hmm. if people say mean things about it or if people say nice things about it. <laughs> All right, so Doesn't let's, matter. let's talk some, a little bit about book. it. If we yeah, can. <laughs> yeah, but no, I still remember it very well. <laughs> Good. Um, so, uh, the novel is, is set in the art world. Yeah. Um, in your other books, you, you used as a launching point uh, other novels, mm -hmm. or, well, uh, Walt Whitman poems for one, yeah. and yeah. Um, Mrs. Dalloway for another, um, which gave it a kind of structure. And this time, actually, there is a, there is a novel in the background. Of Absolutely. This book, the Thomas Mons. Yes, Death and Venice, Thomas Death Mann. Mann. We love you, Thomas Mons. <laughs> So how does that work for you? What do you, you think about, I, I want to choose the novel that I'm going to use as a, as a structure, or how does it work? No, these, these are all writers, Mon, Whitman, and Wolf, who matter to me so much that they seem to be sort of entwined in my, in my DNA. Um, they're part of the way I look at the world, they're part of the way I think about the world. They're part of my life experience. I've, I've, I've never agreed with the notion that, that living your life is somehow separate from reading, as, as, if, as if going to the supermarket was real life and reading a great book was somehow a retreat from real life. I feel like reading a great book is, 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 a, is, a, is a sort of furious and decisive march into real, into real life. All, all, albeit, albeit written a hundred years ago. Uh, and I would stack reading Mons, Death in Venice against a trip to the supermarket any day. So <laughs> I feel like these books are very much a part of my life's experience. And, and we are expected as novelists to use our life experience to, you know, to write about our fathers who threw us down the stairs and the, and the girls who broke our hearts. But we are, for some reason, a little less widely expected to draw on the books we've read which may, in fact, have made a deeper impression on some of us than the fathers who threw us down the stairs or the girls who broke our hearts. I read somewhere that you, uh, at one point in your life, you, you used to speak Walt Whitman poems almost like your character in Specimen Day sometimes. I did, I did. Well, it was really to pick up girls, but it never really worked. <laughs> Do you pick up girls? That was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now I just try to pick up any, anybody, anybody who can't walk faster than I can. <laughs> uh, so By Nightfall also is fascinatingly set in the world of, of, uh, of the New York contemporary art market and there's these wonderful moments where you have different works of art that the art dealer is working with or some he's trying to sell, some he's really drawn to, some that sort of represent what are sort of the contemporary values of, of fine art. Yeah. And uh, I mean obviously you're uh, art lover, but did you spend a lot of time with gallerists to talk to them about I this? did, I did. I actually, uh, the heroic Jack Shaneman of the Jack Shaneman Gallery in, in New York let me stay at the gallery for a week and I helped hang a show, I went to the opening and, and he actually let me pose as one of the, a member of the staff. <laughs> and I put her in a suit oh, yeah? and, met, and, and met a couple of the clients and tried to sell them paintings. Oh, so you were selling art. Did you actually succeed? I didn't sell anything. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Do you, think, do you think buy this painting or I'll kill you was a little too intense? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes, maybe. Um, what does it take to sell a painting, do you think? Um, you have to be very cool about it. 
you have to you 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 affect a certain nonchalance. It's probably a little like selling it's like like selling anything. Uh, certainly with a painting, you want to convey the notion that this is a rare opportunity for the possibly unworthy buyer. You 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 sort of you sort of try in a very subtle and friendly way to make it clear that you, a mere mortal, are so lucky to be offered the opportunity to buy this work of art. And if you are fool enough to turn it down, some other girl's gonna marry the prince in a second. <laughs> All while smiling and, 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 and offering coffee. Yeah. Well, you also have to live with it. You have to be able to have it in your, in your life as part of your surrounding. Yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, which, which people should think about. Do you want, do you want, to, li do you want to live with this? Mm -hmm. though, though as a dealer, uh, you're approaching it more from the standpoint of, I have to decide if this painting wants to live with you. <laughs> it's all, it was really about making the, per the person feel so humbled that, that they write you a check just to get out of the room. <laughs> He's gonna be selling some paintings after this. <laughs> I will, I will, clown paintings, my own. Um, and so, the, so Mitzi, who's the mistake, who yeah. arrives in the midst of this family in New York and um, and is, is a kind of, I think you were describing him as a Roman, Romanesque statue or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That he is, a, he is a work of art in himself, except that he's a flawed work of art. Very much, very much. But yes, yes, Peter, the protagonist, who is looking for a great work of art, finally finds what feels like something ancient and immortal in this, in this boy, sort of, who, who would, if anything, be the subject for a sculpture, and not 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 a sculpture himself, but 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 in twist in in Peter's slightly twisted mind, the boy becomes like a work of art, and he becomes sort of obsessed with the boy, the way a different sort of collector might be obsessed with a Greek urn. Mm -hmm. And um, without giving too much away, <laughs> mm. uh, well, it becomes a, he, he becomes very attracted to him in that way, as a work yeah. of art, but also, obviously, as a person. Yeah, there's a lot going on. And something happens. And um, the, uh, but it's interesting, because in this narrative, um, it, uh, Peter is a 44-year-old man. He's sort of having a midlife crisis in, a, in an oversimplified way. And, um, and he wants to find something that will move him, not just... Um, for his gallery, of course, but also right, for himself. Right, right, right. But a, in a more typical narrative, it might be a woman or a younger woman that he... Tell me why you chose to uh, use a young man. I feel like it would be more interesting for Peter, who is essentially heterosexual, to, to see this embodiment of beauty and this sort of reincarnation of his young wife in a boy. If it was a girl, they could have an affair, or not have an affair, but it would be it would, it would be a it would be a different sort of, of romance. This is a sort of a doomed love because uh, these guys are not really into boys. <laughs> They're into each other, but it's not it's it's not it's 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 not really a gay thing. It's it's a it's a worship thing. Hmm. There's a um, fluidity. Um, of sexuality in your novels in general. Very much, yeah. <laughs> People seem to be willing to be attracted to various, uh, to, to any other sex. And, uh, and I, I wonder if um, that's, you were talking at uh, dinner, we were talking about how in Italy you were saying that uh, you're very popular partially because the gay novel is still very transgressive. But in a way, I was thinking that the, that the novel or the, the story in which um, any sexuality is available to characters is even kind of more more transgressive. Yeah, well, sex is hard to write about. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Oscar Wilde who once said, everything in the world is really about sex except sex. Sex is really about power, which I find useful when I'm trying to write about sex. Uh, <laughs> what I, what I'm, part of what I'm interested in as, as a writer when it comes to sex and sexuality is sort of paying tribute in whatever way I can to the complexity of our sexualities and, and, the, and the fact that as far as I can tell, each one of us has his or her own sort of inner sexual topography that is so particular to us 
that the appellations gay, straight, and bisexual are so general as to be practically useless. Um, for instance, I'm a gay man. I identify as gay. I've lived with a man for 24 years. Um, and one of my best friends is a straight guy who's been married to a woman for 20 years. And we talk about everything, uh, sex and love, and uh, we have no limits. Um, and the more I talk to, to, to Rob about his feelings about his wife and their long marriage, the more I feel like he and I are, are enormously similar, though, though we, are, we are oriented in different ways, as opposed to my friend Joe, who's a leather guy, who can only sleep with strangers and only sleep with them once. Um, and I love Joe, and, and, I, and I certainly respect his, his passions but they are very little like mine. And I actually feel more affinity, even, on, even in terms of my sexuality, with Rob than I do with Joe. And if, and, and if, if, if they're kind of divided us up and say, okay, gay people in that room, straight people in that room, I'd want to go with Rob, even though, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, not, it's, it's not just who gets us hot. <laughs> Though that, though that, of course, is huge. <laughs> uh, you have a sex scene in this book, too, which... Uh, I do a straight sex scene. Yeah, a straight sex scene. What was, what was it like to write that? I did research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us about that. How did you do research? <laughs> That's for after. <laughs> Great. Um, and a more sort of abstract topic, um, you, you tend to use this sort of triangulation of your characters in one yeah, way or another. Yeah, you seem yeah. to be fascinated by triangles and characters who learn things about each other through, through a third party. Right, right, right. Well, I just, I just think that as we, as, we, as we start up from one, three is the first interesting number. <laughs> one is, you know, the loneliest number. It, it's, it's, um, it's just what, can, what kind of conflict, what kind of drama can really arise out of one person. And two people to elements of any sort can only be symmetrical. Wherever, where, wherever we move them, they're, all, they're always in symmetry. You get, you get three, and the, com and the permutations are, en are, are endless. And they can, be a, they can be an isosceles triangle, they can be an equilateral triangle, they can, they can be... Three gets interesting. I love three. I'm all about three. <laughs> so there are three in the new novel? Yeah. Yeah, three. Who Maybe five. Five's a good number, too. <laughs> five? That could be interesting. Sex scene with five. <laughs> Don't get me started. Um, let's talk about uh, your, your work outside of the world of novels. You're, uh, you were talking at, at dinner about uh, work trying to propose something for television. Yes, yes, I'm trying. I'm, 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 I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to L.A. Um, later in November to pitch a TV series to HBO. I love television. <laughs> I think television is great. I think television just beats the hell out of the movies now. There's so much great TV. Like, are you watching Mad Men? And um, <laughs> did you watch The Wire? Mm -hmm. This is great stuff. I, 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 feel, I feel like America, American movies are just pouring, just pouring crap into the world by, by the ton. And American television is in a renaissance right now and will be probably remembered as some kind of golden age. So yeah, I, I lap it up. And, and if, if HBO will agree to it, I'd love to write a show for them. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the plot you've got planned? Uh, yeah, a little bit. It's, 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 a, it's, it's really about my friends. It's a show about my friends. It's, <laughs> um, it's about a big extended family um, who live in Brooklyn who are variously gay and straight and have children or don't have children and are sort of struggling to live and um, a writer who's writing a novel about them all. And so we, we, we move from what's actually happening to what the writer sees is happening, um, and blah, blah, blah. But it, it's, uh, oh, God, I really want to do it. Dying to do it. Please, <laughs> please, please, let me do it. Um, 
After reading, if you read the hours and then you watch the movie, and if you read the um, at home at the end of the, at home at the end of the world and then watch the movie, you realize just uh, how difficult it is actually to translate the the world of your characters onto the screen. Even though I think it's been done successfully, yeah. there's so much of your characters are uh, internal. It's these small moments where they're trying to remember who they were or who they could be or how they relate to the, their own selves and their future and their past. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and so what's it like to see that translated into, uh, into visuals? Well, I've been lucky in that the two books of mine that have been made into movies have been made into, into good movies. I mean, consider the odds. I'm probably the only living writer who's actually been happy with what Hollywood did. <laughs> um, and one of the things you realize is that in a movie you lose the interiority that's available to you as a novelist, of, of, of course, but you gain what the actors can do. Mm -hmm. um, you gain in the, in the movie version of the hours, um, Julianne Moore's ability to be falling apart in the bathroom and say to her husband in a perfectly normal sounding voice, I'm fine. Everything's fine, and you can't really do that on paper. You get you get you get Nicole Kidman's vampire kiss, in which she's trying to literally almost suck the life out of her sister, which would be hard to do mm. on paper. So it's a kind of it's a it's a it, it you lose you lose something, but you really gain something too. It helps to have, of course, brilliant and amazing actors. It helps a lot. Mm. And you. Uh you wrote the screenplay for Very Home at the End of the World. I did. And then, and now, but you've also worked on other screenplays. Oh, Tales of Hollywood, yes, yes. You know, <laughs> I started writing for the movies, and um, what was I thinking? You know, it, it, it's, been, it's been a little bit like when you go out with some guy or girl who's been just horrible to all your friends, and you think somehow you're going to be different. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like this person's track record somehow won't apply to you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's been um, it's been rough. Let's just say it's been rough. I've, I've got I've got two more I've got two more movies going sort of in the works, and then um, Papa's going to say goodbye to the movies for a while. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you what Russell asked you also. What is uh, what's it been like after you won the Pulitzer? How did it change your life, and how does it change your writing? Uh, it certainly made me a lot busier. Um, It's made, it's, it was great. I mean, it was great. Of course it's great. Um, and then suddenly you become, of course, the object of a lot of people's understandable desires to, 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 to get ahead themselves. I, act, I actually recorded a voicemail um, that I didn't keep, but, but, but it was a month or so after the Pulitzer, in which I said something like, this is Michael Cunningham, if you're asking me to help you in some way, I'm so sorry, I can't, and I need you not to even leave a message because I don't want to call and, and have to say no. You left that. No, I didn't. I, okay. I erased it, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I recorded it. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it, and it, it was just an impossible position because there are 10 million people writing novels, and about 9 million of them get in touch with you and say, could you help me? publish my novel, uh, and you can't. Um, and I, for a while I got really depressed. Um, having to say no to everybody, uh, feeling like I couldn't really live up to that book. I, I came home after the Pulitzer ceremony with the prize, which is actually a surprisingly modest little object. It's sort of a, it's sort of like a doorstop. I was thinking gold. I was thinking big. Um, <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's a little crystal thingy. Uh, and I held it up and I said to Kenny, the guy I live with, Michael Cunningham, the pre has been years. <laughs> <laughs> but then, after a couple of months of maud m you know, maundering self pity, um, I decided, okay, if if all those years of being unrecognized didn't didn't stop you, how stupid would it be to be stopped by recognition? How crazy would that be? Can take this as a license. Go on. Understand that most of the population is going to hate the next novel, no matter what it is. <laughs> So you're free to write whatever you want, and go. But were you already working on something? Yeah, 
Yeah, on, spe on specimen days, and which almost everybody hated. I was right. <laughs> I was right about that. <laughs> it was a guarantee. Yeah, it was you pretty much slam, it was pretty much a slam dunk. <laughs> and therefore, takes the pressure off. I think maybe no. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not like it's not like I'm hoping to win another Pulitzer Prize. Uh, 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 so yeah, it does take some of the pressure well, off. Well, there's and always the Nobel. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> How are we doing for time? Are you good? Um, okay. Uh, let's talk about structuring because of your, uh, your, at least two of your books were very highly organized and structured uh, via other works of art. And actually, um, uh, by Nightfall is very intricately <coughs> woven, more, more subtly. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you are always uh, sort of referring in one way to works of art that in some way relate to the lives of your characters. Yeah, yeah. And how has that, I mean, I think in, it's, it's an evolution actually, I see in the books. So how do you think of that now in your own, uh, when you craft the books, when you're working on them? I think as a writer who's starting a novel, your first question should always be, what's the simplest, most straightforward way to tell the story? Is it possible to tell it sequentially from the, from the beginning through the middle to the end, because if you sit down and say to yourself, I'm gonna write an unorthodox and experimental novel, it's likely to be hokum, because that's your, that's your ego. Mm. That's, that's you wanting to be an experimental novelist and, and not really serving the story. And I think only if you get into the story you wanna tell and realize that a simple, straightforward approach simply isn't going to get the story told, then, then you start messing around with, with, with time and, and space and, and multiple narrat narrators or whatever. But this one, by nightfall, turned out to be a story that I could tell pretty directly. And I was very happy about that. Mm -hmm. And how did you, are the works of art that you mentioned, they're just creations, or were they actually? Um... Yeah, I, I, I refer more obliquely to actual works of art, like the Damien Hirst shark is of course, a very real thing. But no, the artists who appear in the, in the, in the novel are all invented and their, their work is invented. That was fun. Yeah, they're, they're, they're perfectly invented as uh, sort of symbols of what the character's looking for. Uh, Read it, it's really good. Oh, th <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> Let's see. What else should we talk about? Um, oh, um, Oh, there is something I want to talk about, and I don't know if you've talked about it a lot, but going back through your books, um, um, starting with A Home at the End of the World and uh, Through the Hours, and in this novel, too, there's, there's someone who's dying of AIDS. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, it's like a, if you look at it, it's a history of the epidemic in yeah. some ways, told from different angles. Yeah, yeah. And of, of course, um, I'm sure being a gamer growing up in this century, <laughs> there's no avoiding you know, that as a subject. But how do you feel about it as a, as a kind of rubric that you're using over time? You know, it, it, it's, as a gay man who survived the AIDS epidemic, I, I do feel a little bit like somebody who's been, like somebody who's been through a war. And, and that is going to color your experience for, forever, even if, you, even if you never go back to Vietnam or Iraq or wherever it is you've, you've been, it, 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 it changes you. Um, so the epidemic is not only very much a part of my experience and my consciousness, I also, uh, I, don't, I, I don't want to sound too righteous about this, but um, I'm aware of the fact that uh, certainly in the States, um, HIV has become manageable for people who can afford the medication. And it's still rampant in, in African American and Hispanic communities. Uh, it is destroying Africa. And I am a little bit dismayed to see it disappearing from our fiction. <laughs> As, uh, because, of, because of course, the people who write fiction tend to be the people who feel safe from it. Um, and hey, am I, am, I, am I writing about Africans with AIDS? I'm not. I, that's, not my, that's not my story to tell. But I do feel a little bit like, by the way, it's not over yet. By the way, it's not over yet. Don't let's just move on to other questions mm. quite yet. So do you think it'll be part of the new novel? I can't say. We'll see. 
Okay. I have to wait and see. I never know. <laughs> um, so, uh, what what other ambitions do you have in the in the world of uh, writing? You, obviously, this this TV show, and but in the future, you think you where's what are the uh, the grand projects? Oh, um, well, I want to write another novel and then another novel and another novel, and and I want I want each one of them to be better than the last one because with each novel you learn a little better how to write a novel of. This is, this is not exactly grand, but I'm doing something, um, friend, a friend of mine is doing theater for one in New York, where, where the, peop, the audience comes in one at a time, and it's just alone with the actor, so I'm, write, I'm writing something <laughs> for that. Wow. Uh, and... Oh, you're judging, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm judging the MP, this <laughs> short fiction contest for NPR, the, you know, but the, these, are, these are wonderful things that, things that, 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 come, that that come along. I, um, I'm mostly really happy with the job I've got. <laughs> and and, and, and I'm, I'm, would, would, would love to be able to write novels until I'm 110 and, and fall face forward onto the keyboard. <laughs> well, I hope you do. <laughs> Thank you. All right, shall we open it to questions? Great. Yeah, please. Um, so we have a microphone right here in the center of the room. And uh, now's your opportunity to ask questions of Michael Cunningham about this book or any of his previous books or anything else. Or anything, really. Anything personal and humiliating. Yes, in the back, yeah. please. Uh, I, I heard you your readings of the book, so they must be very interesting. Uh, because I have a lot of you're almost an actor. Like I'm almost an actor. Yeah. I'm a ham is what I am. <laughs> 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 No, no one's ever asked me to. I would in a second if, I, if somebody offered me a good part. Have I ever done any acting was the question. Um, no, but I will tell you this. I have found, and I, I recommend this to any, any writers who may be in the room who haven't tried it, read it aloud at home. It's amazing how revelatory it is as to what, what's interesting and what's not. So I get a lot of practice, you know, sitting like a crazy person in my underwear alone in my room reading <laughs> this stuff aloud to no one but myself. But it's remarkable how a clunker of a line really pops out when you do that. I mean, ideally, you read it to somebody else. That's, that's, the, that's the best of all possible worlds. But, but how many of us have somebody who's willing to listen to the same paragraph every night, five nights in a row? <laughs> I haven't found that. If anyone would be willing to do that, please raise your hand. I will marry you. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, uh, would you, um, I'm supposed to remind them to come up to the microphone. Could, uh, I'm sorry. Unless, unless you're you too shy, mind. in which in which case I'll, 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 I'll just repeat the question. That's nice. Right. Yeah, because it's a microphone. <laughs> it's, 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 it's sometimes a little weird. Um, I kind of get the impression that detachment is, is something that you use in, in your writing, or certainly in what you've been saying today. Is that... Is Did you say attachment? Detachment, Detachment is something that you use in your writing yeah. as Oh, you Did you get that? I didn't really. Did you get it? She was saying <laughs> She was saying that um, you used you seem to use um, detachment as a maybe as a narrative device that yeah. you're Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you, you seem to be outside, yeah? Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I do, I do, I do, a, I do very consciously summon a certain level of detachment in part to offset one, one, of, my, one of my own worst habits as a writer, which is a, which is a cloying sentimentality. <laughs> it's important to know what your, where your Achilles heels are. Most of us have more than one and, and try to act accordingly. And, and I, I think that my, at its best, what I have is a kind of compassion um, for my characters and a real love for my characters and, 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 a, and a love of the world. But that can translate into something sort of melodramatic and purplish, um, which I try to eliminate to best of my ability. One of my, one of my teachers when I was in, in school pulled me aside and said, Michael, when you finish the story, I want you to read it over and give every sentence either an A or a B. 
the great ones get A's, the, the okay ones get B's, and then take out all the A's. Because those are the ones where you're showing off, those are the ones where you're going too far, those are the ones that are about you as some kind of Olympic skater in, on, on, the, on, on, the, on the frozen surface of the English language and are not in service of, to, to the narrative. And it was the best advice I've ever gotten. And I still, I, I still abide by it. This wasn't Scott Turow, though. It was not Scott Turow. <laughs> no, it could have been, but as it happened, it was. I, I, he, was he was one of my teachers, yeah. But, but no, he, would, he didn't say that. Who he just ran into in the hotel here. Yeah, yeah no, Scott Turow said, just give it up and do something else. <laughs> so know your Achilles heel. Uh, yeah, would you mind, actually? Uh, oh, hi, Johnny. Yeah, if you could, if you could be, oh, there we go. <laughs> there that's we go. So much, that's so much better. It is, it is hard to hear. These are my students, by the way. Oh, really? Students, Jenny, hey. that was Lipa. Yeah. <laughs> the microphone makes feel weird. Just know? bring it to your, to your face. There you go. Like these? Uh -huh. There you go. That's good. Good. Uh, I wanted to ask if uh, you are afraid of writing about something. If there is maybe a ghost which is in the closet and mm. you know mm. it's there and you don't want to face it and you say, okay, I would like to, to write about this subject. Yeah. But I'm afraid about it. So you just keep writing about everything else and yeah, don't face yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you have to write about the thing that you're, mo you're most reluctant to write about. Um, for me, I mean, I don't really have, I'm sorry to say I don't have any, any true, truly appalling secrets that I haven't already told people about. Um, <laughs> I'm generally pretty candid about whatever's going on with me. Uh, I found that what is strangely the most difficult for me is the fact that the books will be read by my family, who will find much of what they read enormously upsetting. They will recognize themselves. <laughs> um, they will see things about me that I just as soon we not discuss. Um, <laughs> And yet, and yet, and I, I, I teach writing in America, and I, I always talk to my students about this because it usually comes up. Um, the odds are already so enormously against anybody writing a good book that if you add to that try the, the attempt to write a good book that sort of preserves your good name and doesn't make your grandmother angry, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> And, and really, I mean, I, I, I think, I think this, this, gets, this gets into a, a sort of funny realm um, of the, the novelist as killer, the, novel, the novelist as, as, a, as a not entirely benign agent among, among his or her family and, and peers. Uh, you are actually not there to make valentines to the people you love. And it's, a, and it's a terribly painful thing for a lot of us. But, but if you can't bear it, well, again, good luck. But, but it's, there's, a, there's a meanness in it that, that, of, that often gets, gets sort of um, glossed over hmm. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the romance of it. A novelist is, is, is to some degree someone very loving and compassionate, and to some degree is one mean motherfucker. <laughs> who takes no prisoners. You don't get to just wait until the people die to write about them. It's too long to wait. <laughs> some, of these people, some of these people are too young. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. More questions? Yes. I cannot help commenting on the fact that today is the 2nd of November. And in the USA, everybody who should be or people who should be and aren't doing it are going to the polls. Yes. You mentioned mean. Would you care to comment on the what's happening in America today? On oh, Tuesday? my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't heard any election results yet. I sent, I sent in my absentee ballot because I knew I would be here. Um, it's scary times in the US. Um, People have lost patience with Obama so quickly, and really, I, I, think, I think he's done, for the most part, 
the best job anyone possibly could, given the, given, given the mess he was handled, uh, handed. Okay, it's too bad Guantanamo was still open. There's some bad, sh there's some bad stuff. But um, he essentially rescued the economy. Um, he's bought, he's, 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 he's brought the con he's, he's mended so many fences between the, 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 the George Bush tore down between the, U, the US and, and other countries. But Americans are very much about instant results. And people were complaining about the unemployment rate a month after he, after he got into office. And I am terribly afraid that after a mere two years, too many Americans are, are, are turning on him and we are about to see the Senate loaded up with some truly dangerous and deranged people. Um, somebody, one of, the, one of the journalists I was talking to asked me if I thought the, the America was declining and all I could, I, I, my immediate response was I think was yes, but not fast enough. <laughs> There were a couple of hands over here. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, you have such observant talent um, uh, of people's traits and their interactions with other people. Um, th does does the um, the profession of your partner, who is a psychotherapist, I understand, yeah, yeah. has had any influ influence on that or? Have you studied some sort of psychology or because um, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it, it's, it's like, yeah, a, a psychoanalyst or a psychiatrist is writing those mm, <laughs> characters you. and thank their you. interactions That's a dubious with compliment. It's, 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 <laughs> it's in such detail and so brilliant. Um, thank you. You know, Kenny reads everything I, everything I write. He's the first person who reads it and he has a lot of suggestions, but they're often more about the language interestingly than they are about the psychology of the characters. I, th I think Kenny is reluctant to be the quote unquote psychology expert who comes in and, 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 and fixes my characters. He, he just doesn't want to play that role and I understand that. Um, kind of by the same token that when, when we first started going out I was afraid that he was going to be all shrinky on me and we were going to, we were going to be talking a lot about, about subtext and what did I really mean by that and actually what I found is that by the time he's through seeing 10 patients in a day he's so tired of, 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 of analyzing people's people's motives that that he doesn't he doesn't do any of that with me mm -hmm. I'm under analyzed at home sometimes <laughs> I have to point out to him the subtext but do you discuss do you discuss you know like if you went, went to a party or well, does his way of looking at people has any influence on, on yes, you? Yes, yes. You know, I, I, I think I think on one hand, I don't I don't really use Kenny as my in-house expert, but on the other hand, living with Kenny, uh, I live in an atmosphere of profound intelligence, and and a, and and a kind of ceaseless searching for the truth inside the truth inside the truth and and a, and a razor sharp aesthetic sense and it's 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 the air i breathe with him and that has had a huge effect on what i write i i i don't know if i could do this without his him in proximity um, even if I didn't show the work to him, even, even if I just sort of gave him the, the finished copy when it was done and said, here it is, it's published, honey. Um, he would have a profound and irreplaceable effect on, on what I do, just by what he generates. He's the smartest person I've ever met. And that makes a huge difference, yeah. Does he uh, recognize himself in some of your fiction too? Yeah. <laughs> the That's a drag. <laughs> Yeah, that gets to be a problem sometimes. <laughs> where, uh, there's there a, I see a hand over there. Over there? Maybe, yes. one, maybe one or two more, and then Ms. we'll bid everyone good night. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Um, <laughs> um, I've read that, that some authors um, already know what the book is going to be like from start to finish. And yeah. obviously, from what you said earlier about having no idea whether this new book was going to be talking about AIDS, I understood that 
you don't. I don't. So what starts the book? And I mean, does it just come as it goes? Or yeah, is it the yeah. characters that inspire you? How does it go? The book, what starts the book, since I don't, since I don't plan in advance? Uh, yeah, I find that if I know where a book is going, the best it's likely to do is sort of get there. Simply arrive at its destination, which doesn't feel especially alive to me. Uh, I find that if I work sort of in the dark, trying it this way and trying it that way, starting from a character and a relationship in a place that, well, Flannery O'Connor, an Amer a Southern American writer who I admire enormously, once said, well, how can there be any surprises for the reader if there haven't been any for the writer? <laughs> And I think Flannery was right about almost everything, certainly about that. So I, I proceed sort of in the dark, and I try it this way, and I try it that way, and I, I write a great deal of what I write sort of intuitively, and I write a great big mess of a first draft that bears almost no resemblance to the finished book. I kind of look at the first draft and see, wow, is there a book in here? What would it be about? Hmm, okay, well this and this and this. And then I then I start to plan and 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 control. But the but the but the first the first draft is almost like auto, like automatic writing. Um, and by doing it that way, by relying on my unconscious, by understanding that I'm gonna throw a great deal away, um, I I I hope to do what I think we're all trying to do, which is write a book that's a little bit smarter than I am. And how many drafts do you do? Oh, uh, usually five or six, a bunch. It takes me about three years. So, but that's, that's how it works slow. for me. That's not slow. No, well, yeah, yeah there, it's true. There's writers that take 20 years. <laughs> uh, any other questions out there? No? Let's say goodnight then. Thank okay. you, Nina. Let's say goodnight. Thank you Lovely so much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>